Hello again, welcome back to one more day of Daily Bible Study this week. Uh, we're going to finish up this week looking in uh, uh, chapter 15, we're starting verse 16 uh, with Jesus being mocked. Uh, before we do, let's pray. Uh, loving God, we looked yesterday at uh, how your truth uh, reveals our truth, and our truth is not always pretty. So Lord, help us to identify uh, the times when we are in rebellion against you. And Lord, help us to follow you in, uh, in big ways and little ways, because Lord, we, if we are not keeping our wits about us, if we are not keeping ourselves submitted to you, um, we may find ourselves doing very many similar things to these people. Lord, uh, we remind ourselves that there but for the grace of God go we. So Lord, help us to follow you uh, in when times are easy and when times are hard. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus has been before Pilate. He's been handed over. Barabbas has been released in his place. And now we read, The soldiers took him away into the place, that is, the praetorium, and they called together the whole Roman cohort. They dressed him up in purple, and after twisting a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to acclaim him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they kept beating his head with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling and bowing before him. After they had mocked him, they took the purple robe off of him, and put his own garments on him, and they led him out to crucify him. They pressed into service a passerby coming from the country, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Um, we mentioned Simon, uh, Alexander, and Rufus, and I don't have all my details 100% straight, but my recollection is that the reason why this is included is because uh, these gentlemen would have been known to the people to whom Mark was being written. That is connecting the dots between this key moment in the life of Jesus and also some other people who they would know as either local or traveling um, uh, leaders. And I don't know where uh, Simon the Cyrene would be from, uh, but I bet it's somewhere near where the original audience of uh, this gospel would have been living. But I also, I want to highlight to a certain degree, this is kind of the shadow side, like a dark upside down version of the triumphal entry. When we looked at the triumphal entry, we emphasize, as we do every Palm Sunday, this always comes up in one form or another, that Jesus is almost doing what could be seen as a parody of, uh, of, a, of a triumphant conquering king returning to the capital city where you have Jesus coming in on, instead of going on a horse, he's on a donkey. Uh, instead of waving banners, uh, they're waving palm branches and those kinds of things. Instead of being led by the great army, he's being led by a great throng of the people. Uh, to a certain degree, we see a, a similar kind of parody, but a much more mean-spirited one being done here. And I want to highlight two things that, that could be. So uh, they give him a they give him a dress, dress him up in purple. You, know, you understand purple, um, you know, today, Basically, any color of clothing you want is going to be about the same in our minds. You wouldn't think, like, well, just one versus the other. But in, in these kinds of times, there were certain colors that uh, were uh, rare um, and therefore expensive uh, to produce. And one of them was purple. And as a result, if you were wearing purple of any kind, uh, you were probably fabulously wealthy or probably royalty. So we talk about purple being a color of kings. And we read a story, I believe her name is Lydia, in the book of Acts, where she is a, she is a seller of purple cloth. And you kind of go, how do you just make a living selling one color of cloth? Like, well, at the time, if the color's purple, you can do it. Because that means you have either uh, connections uh, that, that you can make your own purple dye, which would have been very hard to do, or you have connections who are doing that. And in any case, you have enough money that you can have a supply of purple fabric uh, on hand, which is really um, remarkable. So Lydia must have been fairly well to do at the time. But so they put, they dress him up in a purple robe in some kind, and they, and they give him a crown. It's a crown of thorns, but it's a crown. And they, they beat his head with, uh, with a reed, and which is, I don't know to what degree this kind of action, this action sounds to me like what we talk about in terms of coronation, you know, and knighting people and all the rest, acknowledging that way. But if nothing else, this notion of a scepter that he would have is now being used as a stick to beat him with rather than be a sign of the authority and power to rule that it's normally with. So we kind of see this dark, shadowy kind of thing where we realize that it is one thing for Jesus to take on um, the lowly. It's one thing for Jesus to take on the kind of almost parodic um, you know, notion of, of being like a king but not, uh, not in the way we expect. It's something else to have that thrust upon Jesus. And, and one of them is being done, and it's glorious and mighty and, and beautiful. And this other way we see it being done is done with malice. It's being done in a very ugly way, and it's being done in a mocking way. And so it's, one of the, it's the difference between you know, you know, Jesus taking something on himself and having it be imposed upon him. Uh, in the same way, you know, I know my own life, you know, I don't mind, I don't mind um, 
you know, having some jokes being done at my expense. I'm happy to make jokes at my own expense, but when someone comes along and is actually trying to be cruel to me, uh, it doesn't feel the same, even if you look at it from a distance and say, well, it looks, it looks similar, uh, because the intent and the source makes a huge difference, and we see that here. So what we see is that Jesus is being mistreated. And the thing is, these people, these soldiers, may not be otherwise bad people in, this, in a sense that they were not the ones who care whether Jesus is convicted or not. All they know really is, we have a chance. We have a, somebody who is a, an influential person among the Jewish people. He's in our hands. We can do whatever we want to to him because he's going to die within the next day. And when given that kind of freedom, they behave very badly. And history shows us that people unfortunately do this kind of thing far more often than they should. And so it's a reminder for me, and so I extend it on to you, is to think about which times when nobody's watching or when we feel there are no consequences, do we do something that if people could see us doing it, or if people would know that we did it, or if, it could, if, we, if the details were to come to light, uh, we would be deeply embarrassed or even afraid. Um, because I think sometimes we do that, and we don't want to talk about it. And, and I, I, don't, I can't read into your own thoughts about that, but I want you to think about what that might be, and to think about uh, how we might live and how you might live that's different to avoid those kinds of situations, to be a person of integrity, not just when it's easy, not just when it's in public, but when it's hard and when nobody's watching. Well, that's all for today, and that's all for this week. Come back next week, and we'll continue on with more of the Gospel According to Mark. Have a good day.